Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. In this video segment we're going to take a look at the process environment. We'll use what we learned about the process layout in memory to understand how the environment variables are stored and if necessary moved around. In doing so, we'll also get a quick look at what malloc does. But first, let's quickly remind ourselves what the environment looks like. In the shell we can print the current environment by running env. What we see then is a list of key value pairs, many of which we are very familiar with from day-to-day -day usage of the Unix systems. Setting things in the environment is then an easy way for a process to provide information to the user, as well as for the user to provide information to any program written to look for a specific environment variable. And so, by convention, many Unix tools do honor and use certain commonly set variables. See the environment manual page for examples. From experimentation and common usage, you may have noticed that setting variables in one process does not have any effect on another process, and so we can conclude that the environment is process-specific. But how does a process gain access to the environment? From our previous videos, we remember that the layout of a process in memory can be visualized like this. Here we already noted that environment variables can be found near the high address, above the stack. So let's take a closer look. Our extern char star star is found in the BSS segment, as it was declared without being defined in our code. Once exec has transferred control to the startup routine, the environment is then initialized, and our environment variables themselves will be found near the high address, as promised. How did they get there? Recall from our previous segment what the underscore 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 start routine looks like. In here, we set the environment. But then we also pass it into main as well. That is, we have in effect two versions of the environment an extern char star star and a char star star nfp. So let's update our code to compare the extern char star star environment to the char star star nfp passed as an argument. We'll count how many environment variables there are and put out the beginning and end of the array. Ok, here we go. The environment contains 18 elements. The last element, index 17, is the highest address. Our extern char star star environ is found in the BSS segment, as just mentioned. But the char star star envp, since it is passed as an argument to main, is found on the stack, just like argc and argv. Note that envp and environ both look the same, both start at the same address and end at the same address. Ok, so far so good. How do we access the environment or manipulate it though? For that, we have the getenv, setenv, putenv and unsetenv library functions. Getenv retrieves a value, putenv adds a new value, setenv can be used to change a given value, and unsetenv removes the value from the environment. Note that there is a difference between setting a variable to the empty string and removing it from the environment completely. Some tools may only test for the existence of a variable, not for any specific value, and a variable with no value still counts as being set. But now let's think a bit more about how these functions work. Remember, the environment is initially placed near the high address. So there is necessarily limited space, yet we are allowed to update, add or remove values from this array. What does that look like? As we said, nfp as an argument to main must be on the stack. The first element of this array, nfp0, points to an address above the stack, cbb18 in this case. At this location we find the char star, another pointer which points to the actual array of characters containing foo equals bar, and which is found at uh, cc080. How does it compare to our extern char star star environment? That variable is found in the bss segment. But the first element here also points at cbb18, just by like fp0. Similarly, the last element in the array is found at the same address both nfp and environment near the high address. 
Now let's see what happens when we use setInf to change the value of a variable already in our environment. Let's change foo to a longer value. After we call setInf, nfp0 still points at b8198, as does environ0. But the char star at that location now points to a different place. In particular, it looks like setInf dynamically allocated some memory for the new string a longer value, and so updated the pointer at b8198 to point that. How did it do that? Well, to dynamically allocate a buffer, we use the malloc function. This library function will try to allocate the given amount of memory and return a pointer to the beginning of the region it reserved. This memory is uninitialized. If you want to have it to be initialized to all zeros, use calloc. If you need to change the amount of memory you need, you can use realloc to grow or shrink the region in memory. If it can make the change without having to shuffle data around, you may get back the same pointer you handed it, but it will still have updated how many bytes are reserved. And of course, as with all resources, once you're done using it, you should free the pointer. This is similar to how we always close a file descriptor in the same scope in which we opened it. Just like that, you should always free any pointers you've allocated within the same scope, as otherwise you run the risk of a memory leak. Okay. Before we get back to setInf, let's take a brief detour and observe how malloc and friends play out in the wild. Here on the left is a small program that first allocates a memory, then reallocates it to larger and smaller areas. In the middle you see the output from the program. The first call to malloc reserves some data here on the heap. The next call to realloc ends up reserving a smaller region below the one we initially reserved. Likewise, the reallocation of the larger region happens here. And the final reallocation to a smaller region again reserves yet another region of memory on the heap. In this case, each of the reallocations yield a new pointer, even when we shrank the amount of memory we reserved mean that you cannot make any assumptions about the pointer you get back. Ok, back to our environment. We saw that setInf reserved some space for the new value via malloc. Now let's see what happens when we add a new variable to the environment. After our call to putInf, nfp0 still points to the same address as before. But the first variable in environ now is in a different place. It's on the heap now. The pointer at this new address, however, still points to the same address that we had previously gotten back after we called setInf. So why did environ0 move? Our environment atop the stack is only so big. Adding a new variable to the environment might not have fit at the top of the stack, and so, in order to add a new variable, putInf had to first copy the entire env to a new place. That is, putInf allocated new memory for the whole env array on the heap, then copied all the elements of the environ, all the pointers to the values, over and only then could append the new value. Which of course explains why our new value, environ18, points to this address at the heap. And that address here points to the location of another variable which is found in the data segment. This string is found in the data segment of the program as it was included in the program as a fixed string. So, let's note that here envp and environ diverged. After putenv, environ was updated, but envp was not. Which makes some sense, since envp is really just a variable local to main, while environ is a global variable. Ok, so now what's left? unsetenv. Let's see what happens when we call that function. We call unsetenv foo, so the array shrinks by one element, and what used to be index 18 is now index 17. But it is still found at the same address as before we called unsetenv. However, unsetenv removed the first element of the array in this case, environ0, so that all elements shifted down by 1. What used to be environ1 
is now environ0. The address of environ0 itself doesn't change. But what it contains, the pointer to env equals home jshaumer shrc is updated. And that value still remains all the way at the top in the original environment, so environ0 can now point there. Envp, meanwhile, remains unchanged. OK, let's recap. The process environment consists of an array of strings as key equals var pairs. This is by convention, although you can of course put anything in there. The initial environment is set up at the top of the process space by the startup routine and pointed to by the extern char star star environ. The startup routine may further pass the current environment as a third argument into main. We saw that the elements of the array may be removed, moved around as we add new variables, update or remove existing ones. We saw how the elements of the array may be moved around as we add new variables, update or remove existing ones. Sometimes this involves moving them into malloced areas, but it is important to note that manipulation of the environment should only happen via the library functions and the extern char star star environ, not the env p passed into the function. Finally, while a lot of tools rely on the environment or use it in conventional ways, as a defensive programmer you must always verify the sanity of the contents of any variables you plan on using. The user may be able to change them, and if you're not careful, you can easily end up in undefined or at least unexpected behavior. Ok, that about wraps things up. But before we go, here's a link for another exercise for you. Think about how the environment is updated and what might happen if a user were to add hundreds, thousands or tens of thousands of new environment variables. Or what might happen if a user adds a single variable that is thousands of characters long. Play around with this and see if you can identify the limitations and side effects of this. Good luck and have fun! Cheers!